Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I know it's the end of the, almost the end of the session, almost the end of the conference. Uh, there's three reasons why you should stay awake. Uh, first of all, it's about simulations. That's why we're here. It's about Neanderthals. That's always cool. And uh, there is a bit of sex in it. It's virtual sex, but nevertheless, it's sex. Okay. Archaeology tells us stories, and in the, the West Eurasian area, some of the older stories are about Neanderthals. And um, I am going to look for a model of uh, Neanderthals that best matches the archaeology that we have. And that, for me, is the perfect Neanderthal. So don't expect me to look for the red hair, blue eye, you know, no. I'm going to look for the model that best matches the archaeology, just to be prepared. Okay. Um, also cool. What I'm going to do, first I'm going to introduce you to Hominin Space. Uh, that's the model and simulation environment that I'm working with, that I'm developing. Um, I'm going quickly through it. It's a complex system, but I have to highlight some elements of it. Those who have seen some previous presentations know what I'm talking about, but I have to introduce some uh, specific uh, important elements before I get to uh, the genetic algorithms that we more or less uh, mentioned in the uh, previous talk. Uh, I was very happy to see that. Uh, it's, a, it's a method that deals with some of the problems that we all encounter. I have to explain to you about the Neanderthals, of course, and I will present some results. Uh, previous results, and also results that are derived from the genetic algorithm. Okay, um, uh, uh, the research aim for this system is to uh, build an explicit, more or less realistic model uh, for hominins moving through a landscape, an energy landscape. I will explain that in a minute. Um, the aim of this research is also to identify what it takes. So it's an explorative, more or less, effort to create this system. But the aim is a realistic system, so I'm looking for parameters that are somehow, somewhat realistic. Um, I take as a case to the Neanderthals because they are the, um, they are the most researched hominins uh, besides ourselves. Yeah, besides modern humans. Um, and when developing this system, I was very surprised how little we know. So that makes it even worse for other hominins. But the system that I'm developing is a generic system. You could also model other hominin types. Um, quick overview. Um, it's a detailed energy landscape what I'm trying to reconstruct. I use uh, precipitation and temperatures for this. Um, uh, derived from paleo records that we have, and I try to reconstruct an energy landscape in which hominins can um, forage and hunt. They get their energy from animals and from plant foods. I'm trying to reconstruct uh, basically the primary production and derived from that the secondary production that we eat. Um, it's an effort, it's a model. You can criticize it on the details. I won't go into that too much at the moment, uh, but the effect of making an explicit model is exposing and is creating scientific research. So it's an effort. I try to reconstruct the realistic landscape that I'm looking for, and in that I have hominins moving through this landscape. Um, I have parameterized these hominins. There's three groups of parameters. Uh, there's demography, there's energy use, and um, there's group dynamics. I will explain these parameters later on. These are the parameters that I identified as being important for such a reconstruction. Um, I compare, of course, with the archaeological record, and this is what I referred to in the beginning um, when I look for the period that I try to reconstruct, that's about 130,000 years ago to about 50,000 years ago, um, a very interesting period with a lot of things happening, and it's actually just before modern humans arrive on the scene. I do that on purpose because when they come, everything changes. But before you modern humans arrive on the scene, we have a rather constant uh, archaeological record, and it's very sparse. Although we have um, intensively researched the area, uh, 
in the end, it seems that we know very little about Neanderthals, which is an opportunity. Um, it's an agent-based model, and it's used to explore the ideas that we have about these Neanderthals. It's testing hypo hypo hypothesis. Okay? Um, one of the elements that I would like to discuss with you, or at least present very briefly, uh, is the validation of uh, the simulation results. Uh, once I run a simulation, uh, in the end I have to look, is it a valid model, is it a valid simulation? And I do that by comparing the results of a simulation with the archaeology that we have. And one of the things that we know for sure about Neanderthals is if they were there if they were anywhere in the landscape where we find uh, archaeological remains. So I look in the literature, what do we know about the presence of Neanderthals? And um, I give you here an example from um, Emily Goval, her thesis. It nicely illustrates that we have a period of presence. This is the early MIS five stages. We have presence in certain sites, and then we have a period of absence very nicely, because you can check for this. And then we have a period of presence in similar sites and additional sites. Very important for my uh, research is this uh, change between absence, presence, and um, I use and I collect quite a lot of this uh, for my, uh, in my database to compare against. Of course, it's a limited data, there is biases all over the place, but I think we're used to that. Uh, on top of this, uh, this page, you see some of the results. This is uh, mostly TL and OSL dates, um, given for the period that I'm looking at, uh, versus the latitude. Some of these dates are very old from the literature. Uh, you can see this is a standard deviation that I plot here. Um, I, at a certain moment, decided to remove some of these dates because they are non-informative when they cover the whole period. This is a presence indication for the whole period. That's too much. So I arbitrarily decided that if uh, standard deviation extends outside the MIS stage, I remove the date. That leaves me with about 400 dates for the period that I'm looking at and the area that I'm looking at. It's a limited amount, but it's something to work with. So what do I do? I run these simulations, I compare against the archaeology, and I have several statistics that I keep score of. Um, I'm not going to detail all of them. A total visit count is all the visits to all the checkpoints that I have. A checkpoint is one of those points in time and in space where we know that Neanderthals were present. So I, can, I count all the visits. I count all the visits per checkpoint, of course. Um, I count the visits per climate type. Uh, where were they in colder periods? Where were they in warmer periods? Um, I have confidence levels, these older measurements, these TL dates with these huge S standard deviations. They are not so very trustworthy, but there are better, um, better measurements. Um, I can count them, um, I can make them count more. So I attach a confidence level to each measurement. Um, I can count home ranges if they are if my, my Neanderthal groups are actually on this checkpoint, I can count that. And what I like most is the matching intervals. Of course, that's where I use these checkpoints. What you can see here is a matching interval. This, uh, this presence in my simulation actually matches one of these dates that I have, and uh, this one is not. So simple, is it? I look for matching visits, and that's what I use most in, uh, in the further presentations beside this one. Um, what, now, I think what we are all struggling with is sensitivity analysis. Uh, what you see here is the birth rate, um, the birth rate for Neanderthals. 50% uh, means that 50% of the Neanderthal women get a baby. Um, you can see that um, I, I count here the score, the total visit score, and after about 15%, you can see a rise in the scores. After about 40, um, after about 30, there is no difference anymore. I cannot uh, differentiate 
between 30 and 50. Uh, so that's why you need more parameters to characterize the Neanderthal that I'm looking for, these perfect Neanderthals. Um, I tried that by manually varying parameters, parameters um, randomly, and I used genetic algorithms to look for it. I'm really trying to find it. I'm going to tell you how that works. Okay, um, very important assumption in my research is that Neanderthals were constant in the character that I uh, described in these parameters. Uh, both archaeology as well as genetical information tells us that uh, these elements were actually pretty constant throughout the period that I'm looking at. What I explained is as soon as modern humans come into the scene, things change. But before that, it's a rather constant character. That is what I'm using. So what I do is I vary between simulations and not within the simulation. I'm not letting Neanderthals evolve in, during a simulation, but I'm evolving Neanderthals uh, between simulations. And I will explain you how that works. So I have these parameters. What I would also like to explain is that I have uh, what I call uh, settings to differentiate them a little bit. These settings cannot be changed by the user or by the system, uh, only by the programmer. Actually, it's all the same, it's me, but it's a little bit difficult, more difficult to change settings than parameters. And one of these settings is a very important one and that identifies static, static and dynamic Neanderthals. And I'm going to explain them to you in a minute. Um, first, all these parameters are based on ethnographic literature or something that is derived from the archaeology. So you can find the values that I chose for each of these parameters uh, within the literature base. Um, I give a few examples here. Um, uh, I, I like the uh, 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 birth rate in itself. 1% means that 1 in 100 females get a baby every year. Uh, it's a very, very, very low percentage, but 50% means uh, every two years you get a baby. That's a baby production, high production rate. Okay, nevertheless, we go to the static and dynamic economics because that is what the, uh, one of the main hypotheses that we research with this tool. Uh, static and dynamic hominins, um, the static hominins, uh, they, they are what is commonly referred to as sources and sinks. Uh, these are hominins that go somewhere and they stay. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they stay on one place, but this is their home range, they stay there, they forage there, whatever happens. The dynamic ones are the ones that go south if it really gets bad, and they go north again when the climate heats up, when it, when it gets warmer. They move with the environment. Um, it's a rather simple distinction, but it's a quite an intense Discussion. It has been quite an instant discussion in the Paleolithic research what type of mobility characterizes Neanderthals. And so I researched this with the tool, with the hominin space, uh, and with many manually constructed parameters. Uh, and the results are on the right. And what you can see if, yes, I think the, the red ones, they are the static ones, and the blue ones are the dynamic ones. It's a score that you can see, and you can see the red ones are always above the blue ones. I like that, res I like that result. Uh, it confirms more or less what is gen generally accepted in the literature, and I presented this and everybody recognizes. And I explain it a little bit like the dynamic ones, they all go to the same resources, and uh, they are just uh, consuming all these resources that's not enough resources left for those that are there. They die, even if they go to the Mediterranean. It's fun, but there's not enough resource for all of them. And the static ones, they stay, even when it gets colder, you get a reduced population density, but they survive. So that's basically how I explained it. But um, there were cracks in this perfect image. Um, statistical analysis suggested that there would be uh, alternatives, um, a replication effort um, failed to uh, replicate this result, which is uh, very interesting. Uh, it's uh, both an uh, illustration of the usefulness of replication in itself, but it is something that makes me, um, well, you have to work, work harder. Um, I'm not going to explain a lot, but 
uh, you understand that the problem with so many parameters is there is a huge parameter space. We discussed that in the previous, uh, previous talk. And um, what I needed, what I think I need, is an automatic and systematic exploration of the parameter space. And that is where genetic algorithms come. Um, what um, genetic algorithms are inspired by uh, biological uh, processes. Um, they are part of the family in which you also have genetic programming, evolutionary um, strategies. Um, they are actually coined by Mr. Turing, Alan Turing himself. Uh, uh, Hollywood made him famous, but um, he's one of the godfathers. And he coined this way of searching a parameter space. Um, you look for uh, uh, parameter combinations that satisfy a, a fitness function. And this fitness function, we are the matching intervals. So what do you do? You have an uh, initial population, you select from this initial population, uh, and you apply operators, you apply genetical operators on them. You can mutate them, uh, you can uh, mix them, recombine them, or you can apply something like a crossover thing when these genes, when these elements of this chromosome are related. So then you copy uh, from one point in the gene all of the elements. Um, I illustrated them over there. After you have created new individuals, they are returned into the population and the process starts again. In a simulation environment, these individuals are simulated again so that you can get a score. And this score is taken with them into the population. Okay? Um, I explained to you how that works. What we did is we did a thousand runs um, for both these settings, for dynamic and statics. And we analyzed those. So I present you here the first results. Um, what is nice, in green is the static, in red is the dynamics. There's a lot of green tops, but there are also some red scoring simulations. These are the red ones. These are the dynamic ones that score better than the static ones. These are the worrying ones. I illustrated again here. Here I subtracted dynamic from static. The one above the horizontal axis are the better static simulations, the better, better uh, parameter, parameter combinations. And um, underneath, these are the dynamics. So, we did a principal component analysis to look at what does that mean? What is the importance of each parameter for these different settings, for these static and dynamic Neanderthals? We identified a few parameters that are equally important for both, but we also identified uh, set, uh, parameter settings that are important for each of these settings, so we can identify um, 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 th those parameters that are important for each of these settings. So now what we did is we try to evolve them. And we run the genetic algorithms, and these are the first results for the static. Um, remember, uh, 3.5 million was the best score in our previous efforts. We quickly increased that with this static energy um, setting. And this is the dynamic. And here we approach quite quickly the best score of the static ones. This is another one where we varied the tournament size. This is one of these elements of the genetic algorithm. Very important result. The best Neanderthal is this one. It's a dynamic one. I summarize here the uh, main parameter characteristics. It's dynamic with a high birth rate. Um, Low death rate for pre-fertile and fertile, but high death rate for post-fertile. It's a live fast and die young Neanderthal. Mm -hmm. uh, you can expect that, but in the end, uh, for me, this is quite, uh, well, let's say, quite surprising. Um, I'm going to look into the details, what it means. Uh, you can see that there are also other scores that are really good. These are, let's say, other optimums within the parameter space. And that's where I'm going to look at. The, the next step will be to explain these parameters and to further explore this parameter space.
I would like to thank you here.